Hello, Mr. Ackerman. Good, good afternoon. Um, would you mind introducing yourself uh, briefly for the tribunal, please? Um, I will. Um, I'm Jeroen Ackermans. I'm a Dutch uh, reporter for RTL News in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, been a correspondent traveling starting in London, then to Luxembourg of all places, uh, Moscow, um, and for the last 20 years I've been reporting from Berlin uh, and Eastern Europe. Um, and the case I'm going to talk about today is um, the case from 2008. Um, and if you allow me, I would like to explain a little bit of the case so you know um, why this is an important case um, and why this case is telling for the impunity we are discussing today. Um, I won't go here because I think it's easier for me Please. to talk to the audience from here. I hope you can hear me. You can? That's good. Um, we are looking here at uh, the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. Um, yes, I've been there, I've done that. Um, going to court sounds cool, um, as if fighting for justice makes the victim of a war crime feel stronger. But for us, the road to justice has been just a disaster. For nearly 13 years, both the ICC in The Hague, that you see now, here and the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg have uh, ignored the rights of the victims in what I believe is an exceptional strong case. The facts. On the last day of the five-day war between Russia and Georgia in 2008, an Iskander missile, look at the bastard, was fired from Russian territory into the Georgian town of Gori. 20 kilometers behind front lines. This town, that you know, had been evacuated. There was no soldier left. There was no military object in the vicinity. And as far as I know, firing a missile in 50 kilometers up in the sky, 50 kilometers up, come, coming down onto the square of an empty city center with just civilians on it, is a war crime, and I hope you agree. It landed here on the Stalin Square, as it still is being called in Georgia. The missile carried a cluster bomb, and when this exploded on the square, thousands of metal fragments flew in all directions in order to kill or maim everyone alive. My colleague, and here we go, Cameraman for Dutch RTL News, Stan Storymans, died when the cluster bomb exploded and 11 Georgian civilians died with him. It's been live recorded on five security cameras. You see the metal fragments flowing, flying around. It's a storm, as I know, because I was standing on the same square. The Israeli journalist Sadok Yecheskeli was riddled with over 30 of these bullets, but he survived. I was only hit by a few fragments in non-vital parts. And this is typical cluster bomb damage. Buildings around the square showed typical cluster bomb damage, like the tiny holes you see in the windows. A cluster bomb only destroys humans, not buildings. There is no doubt the Iskander missile belonging to the Russia, is belonging to the Russian arsenal, which delivered the cluster bomb on the square. Yes, it was the Russian 630th uh, Iskander training battalion who did it. And they were proud of it. Um, in the 2009 Victory Parade, it was praised as an quote unquote effective weapon. Ura, they say afterwards, all the soldiers on the Red Square. Even the impact of the scone of the missile has been recorded too on camera, as you see on the red arrows. 
leaving its marks on the tarmac. And here we are. This photo has been photographed by an international journalist uh, called Burak Karma. Fragments have been observed by Dutch and foreign diplomats, by international journalists, investigators, and yes, also by me. So this is not hocus pocus. These big Iskander parts have been observed, photographed, um, and uh, taken for analysis uh, by uh, numerous investigators. Now, the, uh, the widow of uh, Stan Storymans, Majorlijn, relatives of the Georgian uh, victims, Zadok, and me, we sued the Russian member of the European Council for violation of the right to life at the Euro European Courts Court, uh, in, uh, at the European Courts in Strasbourg. Yes, we have such rights. Even on the front line, you have a right to life for every civilian. And yes, Russia signed up for the Human Rights Convention. But what appears to be a clear-cut case drowns in a judicial swamp. I'm going too fast here. The swamp arises from the Russian denial. The Russians told the court that the missile parts could have been stolen from the missile test site in Russia. I'm not kidding. According to their conspiracy theory, the Americans might have taken these remnants from Russia and transported them secretly across borders and planted them on the crime site in Georgia, a thousand kilometers away. I'm not making this up. It's been told like this in court. Photos of the remnants like these, fake too, according to Russia, just to here it comes to blame the Russian army. Now the cluster bomb. Also our car, which was on the crime site, was riddled with small holes. I took this photo of the car window and I took three fragments from the car, the damaged car, for forensic analysis in the Netherlands. These tiny, tiny shit of bullets. Guess what? The Russian delegation suggests in court again, the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg, that I'm a liar because they say there was no cluster bomb whatsoever uh, deployed by the Russian army. According to Russian lawyers, there are no holes in the car window, which means I'm showing you once again a fake photo. The Russian delegation, um, we're with a representative of the Russian government, by the way, um, in court, still the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg, uh, even suggested that the deadly cluster bomb piece in the heart of Stan, found, located in the heart of Stan, might have been planted in his body too, once again to frame the Russian army. But if it wasn't the Russians, who else? Please tell us, Moscow. Well, the Russians, uh, by the name of Mr. President uh, Medvedev, during a visit in the Netherlands in 2009, he suggested it could have been a mortar grenade, a weapon which, uh, of, for which uh, its identity of the perpetrator is not easily established. All expert know, experts know this. The Russians have the resources and the motive to investigate such an allegation, but no. The mortar was just created to create fog and to uh, um, uh, protect the perpetrators. For your information, a cluster bomb causes shallow craters, as you can see here on the square. There were many of these shallow craters, I can promise you. Despite all evidence, the Court for Human Rights recently ruled in a so-called umbrella case that war crimes committed during the so-called active wartime will be ignored, protecting the war criminal instead of the victim. This court ruled it will only look into war crimes committed after the signing of the preliminary peace deal at noon August 12, 2008. 
not the war itself, um, but not the war criminal, not the war victims themselves who are the most vulnerable uh, get the protection they need, but the war criminals. This incredible ruling means that Stan was killed 78 minutes too early for any kind of justice at the European Court of, for Human Rights in Strasbourg. I call it surrender of the justice system. Can you feel the slap in the face? For all the victims, the battle for justice has nothing been a, but a humiliating experience. It's even difficult to pronounce here. We've been left alone, dumped on the mountain of good and bad intentions. A cheap denial of a powerful defendant was all it took to escape justice for 13 years. The message is clear. Our case shows that the credibility of the international rule of law is at stake here. Time to do something about it. Time to take action. Thank you. Just one question to follow up, uh, and thank you very much for that detailed and meticulous explanation. What do you think, and I'm calling for a speculation, what do you think are the obstacles um, for not achieving justice after all this? Well, if, if, uh, if, if we indeed want to file a case in the Netherlands, which is a backdoor, as I call it, we need to have the, the, the chain of command. Uh, we need to know who we want to prosecute. Well, I can tell you that I've been, uh, together with other people, good experts, uh, we've been investigating this chain of command. The thing is that there was only one Iskander battalion in 2008. So we know where they are, we know who the commanders were, we have their names. And perhaps you know, in, in the same realm of things. Do you think that the reasons are strictly political, was that you hinting, or there may be technical? So I guess the thing as we look at impunity from all its, its, its trends and in an effort to genuinely address it, do you think there are technical difficulties? Do you think that the evidence, or it's just been no technical reason whatsoever? Well, the, the, obviously there are obstacles and there are technical uh, uh, problems, judicial problems, but after 13 years, I'm a bit tired of looking for excuses. This is a terrible, you know, how often does it happen that a, a war crime has been live recorded, that there is a, a, a murder weapon leading only to one perpetrator? You know, normally this is not the case, and if in such a strong case there is no judge to even prosecute, well, what does this tell us about the international justice system? I'd like to hear your answer. And I may not have one. Um, and in the last, last question, uh, what it will be, understanding that there may be limitations, because I think it's some, something that we also forget often. I understand that there may be limitations to, to the judicial system and to the current laws applying international humanitarian law and the like. What do you feel that should be done to acknowledge what happened, to revise what happened, to analyze that will feel like justice for yourself, Mr. Ackerman, and for your colleague? Well, I'm not sitting here just for myself. I'm sitting here uh, in the name of the relatives of Stan. I'm sitting here uh, because of uh, Zadok Yegeskeli, and I'm sitting here for 12 Georgian, uh, the relatives of 12 Georgian victims who have been left alone for 13 years by uh, uh, all authorities. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really uh, care what, 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 what the, the reasons for not having justice so far, but we need some sort of a signal from the international courts that indeed, in this case, where the, the, the proof, the evidence is so, so strong that we have to do something here. I mean, like, if, what is this, what kind of precedent is this ruling setting for all the, uh, the war crimes to be, of the future, all the wars, you know, the human rights court a human rights court is saying to us, we're not going to deal with 
all the uh, uh, violations of the Con Human Rights Convention at wartime because it's too chaotic. We cannot uh, uh, see for clear. We cannot clearly see who is in, in the authority. Well, if people want to get more uh, details of who was in control of the of the front line uh, on the August 12th, I can assure you that the Russian army was. I mean, anyone who is looking into the case will know this, but they don't. They refuse to look at it. I mean, what are we, what are we, what are we doing here? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 mad and sad. Grace, any question? No. Thank you very much.